Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining NATF's Ask the Expert, our special edition on the COVID-19 vaccine. We have gotten a lot of questions over the past couple of weeks about the vaccine, so we're absolutely delighted to have John Finikos with us this evening to answer those questions. John is the Director of Pharmacy Business and Financial Services at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. He is also an Assistant Professor of Clinical Pharmacy Practice at Northeastern University and at the Massachusetts College of Pharmacy. And John, most importantly, is also the Treasurer of NATF. So thank you so much for being with us tonight, John. Ah, well, thank you very much. So thank you, Catherine Mickelson and Courtney, who's here. Uh, I don't know if Aviva is in the audience or who else sure is. She is. Joined <laughs> us from the NATF uh, offices on Boylston Street. Um, if you're in the neighborhood, feel free to knock, right, Catherine? Yep. Uh, yep. There's usually somebody there where, uh, um, if I remember, Correctly, um, is ACE ticket still open at? Um, uh, I don't think we're selling the many tickets. Yeah, I don't <laughs> think there's many events going on right now. And that leads us into our conversations surrounding COVID, COVID vaccines. Um, mm -hmm. As you can see, Catherine said, this is an opportunity to ask the expert. I have crossed out the word expert because I don't consider myself an expert in anything. I have a lot of perhaps pharmacy skills, nothing that's applicable in the home setting, like cleaning a clock sink or using a vacuum. But um, I will hopefully give you a glimpse or a picture of what's happening um, and hopefully um, answer some of your questions surrounding uh, the COVID uh, vaccine and its rollout. And, and hopefully if you have questions, we can answer them. So um, here's my outline. I'll give you a quick COVID update. Um, uh, we have to talk about Operation Warp Speed. Um, uh, let's touch upon the emergency use authorizations. We'll chat about the vaccines themselves. Let's talk about what's happening with the vaccination plans in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and at Mass General Brigham, because that's where I work. Um, and then we'll go through some counseling screening and questions I think that may be common. And then finally, hopefully I'll answer the most obvious question that everybody asks is, you know, why can't I get a vaccine? So let's start with uh, the COVID update. So um, here's uh, a case of a patient that um, was just recently in our hospital. So briefly, a 69-year-old male, so he resonates because I'll be 60 years of age this year. Um, his past medical history, he had high blood pressure and diabetes, but he came to our emergency room with a fever, a cough, and he was breathing rapidly, but not getting any oxygen through his lungs. So, when we put a pulse oximeter, a little device on his index finger, instead of his oxygen in his blood being close to 100%, his oxygen was at about 80%. So he, it wasn't that he couldn't breathe, that he was just rapidly breathing and not still feeling like he was short of breath. When they did a chest X-ray and, and you see his X-ray to the right, Normally, the lung fields are crystal clear and show up as black, but in his instances, he's got a whole host of opacities, and typically, a radiologist describe COVID infections as being or taking on the appearance of ground glass. If you ground glass and put it on a surface, that's what it appears on x-ray. So he was diagnosed with adult respiratory uh, disease or acute respiratory distress syndrome and transferred to our ICU. He was quickly quickly recognized that he wasn't going to be able to breathe on his own. And so he was intubated and placed on a ventilator. And because of that, we gave him medication so that he was basically paralyzed. And he quickly became hypotensive and we needed to give him medications to maintain 
his blood pressure within normal limits. And during his course of care, his COVID test came back uh, as positive. So the so-called PCR test that is commonly done now. And I can tell you, for frame of reference of our program, he had complications on his course both deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism, which is not uncommon in these patients, but um, his his uh, his recovery was extremely slow, um, and he was uh, in our hospital for over two months before he finally left. Um, and he left, you know, with his one of his daughters, and I think he's doing well today. But the reason I put this out there is I think this is the classic case um, of why the vaccine becomes so important. The drugs that we have available uh, aren't great. Um, we've certainly made some improvements in antiviral therapy with the drug remdesivir and some antibody cocktails that may fight uh, the presence of the virus. I'm not going to talk about those today, but just to tell you, I think prevention is far better than trying to find the cure. So um, here is the story of uh, the so-called COVID-19 virus, or coronavirus, uh, discovered in year 19, if you look at the bottom of the slide, and the nomenclature uh, of the World Health Organization. Um, other organizations have used different terminology, and you'll see the term severe acute respiratory syndrome or SARS. And since uh, this was a coronavirus, it is the second one uh, that was identified uh, in 2019. So SARS-CoV-2 is commonly used. But the story is still the same. You find somebody that's infected. Um, it is indeed a respiratory disease, and so droplets when you cough or sneeze transported into the air and onto surfaces and then they too can contaminate or spread the virus to other unsuspecting patients um and let's see if this works um this should take us to the new england journal of medicine website um and i put this in um because i think it gives a pretty good depiction of uh you know, what uh, has happened uh, with this virus spreading across the world. So um, I'll start the video. And so this is a picture of the world and you can see the virus started in Wuhan, China. Um, and the different colors represent, blue representing new infections, um, yellow representing a heavy density uh, or infection rate. And I think what I hope you can appreciate is how contagious this virus is. And then within a 60 day period, it managed to go from China in December all the way to the United States, uh, reaching epidemic proportions in early March in, in New York City. Um, so uh, it, it truly does represent a major problem. Um, here are some of the numbers uh, that you can appreciate. Um, to the left, the graphic shows the number of cases uh, in the United States. Uh, in the graphic to the right, the number of Massachusetts COVID infections. I'm sorry, that was my dog Otis whining. He was sitting with me. But you can appreciate uh, the number of cases that have been reported and probably more importantly, the urgency surrounding a vaccine because of the number of deaths that are shown. Um, in the middle with uh, almost a half a million now in the United States um, and about 15,000. And there's hot spots in the country. You'll hear about it. Um, I mentioned New York City. We were certainly hot in April, uh, March and April. Um, I think we had about a two week window ahead of New York City. Um, and then we got hot again around the holidays of um, Thanksgiving and Christmas. And now uh, the uh, the number of infections is starting to subside again. So if you leave people opportunities to interact with each other, um, the virus spreads and it spreads pretty quickly. Um, I think we owe uh, some sort of uh, debt of gratitude to the US government. I don't know who you want to sign that gratitude to, but they launched um, uh, the Operation Warp Speed 
with the intent of shortening the time the vaccine was delivered um, to us as clinicians and the ability to inoculate uh, patients in the community. And the goal, of course, is to create this concept of herd immunity. And you can see the definitions here. You, when you vaccinate enough people in the community, the disease now is no longer able to spread. And uh, the people that have immunity now protect those that do not. And we typically believe you can achieve uh, herd immunity by just letting the virus spread, which is what some countries have done, certainly in Sweden um, and others uh, in the European continent. Um, but the real solution is to vaccinate at least 70 to 80% of people, then the virus will disappear. So Operation Warp Speed was this collaboration between the FDA, um, the Food and Drug Administration, a uh, series of manufacturers, um, and then a whole host of organizations that were going to launch Operation Warp Speed that included Health and Human Services and the Centers for Disease Control um, in Atlanta. Um, down the bottom, um, we'll talk later on about administration sites di uh, distribution and delivery um, and support for the program. But I think what's most important here was is finding uh, a series of vaccines that we could work in a short period of time. And our colleagues in pharmaceutical industry have done that. Um, they have delivered. <clears throat> and I can tell you the trials um, at Brigham and Women's and at Mass General and other facilities within our system started way back in July. Um, we were focused on both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. Our colleagues at Moderna are located in Cambridge. Um, and I uh, would urge you um, to at least recognize the work that several folks have done at the New England Journal of Medicine. I'll highlight Dr. Lindsay Baden, um, who I think has single-handedly led um, the uh, group of academic physicians that specialize in infectious disease to come to the table um, and bring these vaccines through their studies in an incredibly rapid period. So we started the studies um, in July and we were finished by really early um, November and had the results in December, which is unheard of. Um, and then the vaccines became available. So two vaccines uh, that I'll focus on, uh, which I'll affectionately refer, refer to as Pfizer, and that came from a collaboration between Pfizer and BioNTech, um, and then the Moderna vaccine from the folks here in, in Cambridge. So uh, both of the trials for these agents have been completed. Um, and the results are available on the New England Journal of Medicine website. I'll go through that in a minute. But what was most important prior to these publications coming out, um, the United States Food and Drug Administration has a method of approving drugs under an emergency use authorization. So that uh, typically drugs have to go through several phases of development phase one through phase three. Phase three usually ends in patients that are uh, inflicted with the disease. Um, but in instances where there is an urgent clinical or public health need, um, the FDA has the ability to approve these drugs for routine use. Um, they are essentially not approved in the truest sense of the word, but they do meet all of the requirements of the FDA standards for clinical trials. Um, there must be scientific evidence. Um, there has to be safety associated with the drug. So there has to be evidence of efficacy and evidence of safety. Um, and then the government, the Food and Drug Administration, anticipates that those trials will continue so that the accumulation um, of information can follow what is routinely done um, and its FDA approval process. So we've had these emergency use authorizations before. We had the old H1N1 swine flu 
epidemic that uh, allowed for uh, uh, a vaccine to be given um, and in in and around that uh, epidemic of about 10 years ago. Um, but this is the first time I think we've seen something like this stood up with a number of agents. So um, uh, there isn't, as I suggested, uh, a licensure associated with FDA approval. So um, it's truly not FDA approved, but on the other hand, it's still not considered an investigational drug. So it's in this kind of quasi in-between period of finally getting an FDA approval, which eventually it will um, with it, uh, both of these agents with the information that's available um, through the clinical trials. But there is a fact sheet that goes with it. And if you come to our hospital to get an injection, you will be given a fact sheet that you can read and it contains all of the information that we have available. Um, put the uh, web link for that fact sheet um, at the bottom of the page. And the fact sheet's information does change periodically, um, but it's there in case you need it and it outlines the information surrounding the drug for the vaccines. So let's talk about the vaccines uh, for a little bit, and I won't delve into a great deal of detail, but um, in this slide, what I can assure you is the process of generating vaccines uh, can be done in a number of different methods. Um, as you might expect, it's extremely complicated. It requires an understanding, obviously, of human biology and physiology, but most important, immunology, and that these vaccines work through the generation of antibodies that prevent the infection or spread of virus within the human body. Um, and if you look, it is actually um, this methodology on the far uh, right of this slide um, that has been used for both the Moderna and Pfizer drug development products. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about those um, uh, right now. So um, there is not a history of using the methodology of these vaccines um, yet to manage disease, uh, specifically for the coronavirus. So we are using a messenger RNA technology. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, it's encapsulated in a lipid or fat molecule. Um, and then that formulation is actually injected into your arm. Now, when I say it hasn't really been tested yet, um, there, this platform has been used for Ebola and for the Zika virus, but both of those viruses really disappeared from the planet, and we never really had a chance of using this platform to prevent a treat or, or prevent the spread of a, a virus until uh, the COVID-19 infections, okay? And we'll come back to that in a second. Now, there are lots and lots of other vaccines that are in different stages of development. Um, at the far right, you'll see um, Johnson & Johnson has been developing uh, their virus. Uh, they requested emergency use authorization on Friday last week. Um, their technology platform follows the traditional, we'll take an element of the virus we will somehow weaken it or attenuate it so that it can't cause infection. Your immune system will react to it and we will inject it into you and you will be granted immunity by that technology. Um, that is coming it's, uh, and we can talk a little bit about that if there's questions. There is also an AstraZeneca virus that has been, again, developed through the common technology of using a virus as a delivery system uh, into your immune system and having your immune system recognize that the AstraZeneca vaccine has been granted approval um, and is being used in the United Kingdom, all right? We have not seen it yet here in the United States because the development was not done here. So right now, if we look today, the only games in town that are available in terms of vaccination of the Moderna and the Pfizer or BioNTech vaccines, okay? And these are the different 
logic or platforms that you can use, um, either a protein base, uh, a viral vector base that I talked about with AstraZeneca and the Johnson & Johnson product. But um, the platform that Moderna and Pfizer used was basically taking messenger RNA. So messenger RNA um, is commonly found in your body. It is the coating that generates or produces proteins in your body. Um, and so through the genius of science, um, uh, these clinicians were able to identify the sequence of messenger RNA that is associated with the sp spike protein that allows the virus to attach to your cells. Um, so by taking that coating um, and basically injecting it into your body, um, your own body will produce that spike protein, which is recognized by your immune system, and generates antibodies that basically attack that spike protein. So your immune system now has antibodies by virtue of the vaccination that recognizes when the corona or COVID-19 virus attaches itself to your cells, if you will, and your immune system automatically attacks to eliminate it and basically prevents infection. So it's, again, quite uh, an ingenious platform. Um, and there are some elements about it here that make it very attractive. First, it is um, non-infectious, so it cannot cause COVID infection if we inject it into you. The delivery messenger RNA is actually rapidly degraded and disappears, but your immune system remains intact once it has seen that generated spike protein. And from a logistics standpoint, because it's a recombinant technology, we can make tons and tons of this vaccine um, using recombinant technology and pharmaceutical industry. Um, we can control its potency and basically its efficacy. And so from a logistics standpoint, this platform being new becomes extremely attractive when you look that we need to vaccinate over 350 million Americans in the United States. There are some disadvantages. So um, we haven't done this before really in humans. Um, it does elicit a local and inflammatory reaction. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and in terms of its um, durability and sustainability, we don't have a lot of details uh, surrounding how long it will maintain its efficacy. So there are some elements about the agent itself that because we've never used it before, we need to find out. Okay, I showed you the two clinical trials uh, in New England Journal of Medicine um, that were published uh, last year uh, in November and December, or December and January, I'm sorry, December and for the Pfizer vaccine, January for the Moderna vaccine. Um, let's stop for a second. The Pfizer study, they treated almost 45,000 patients. And the final analysis of 170 infections there were 162 cases in the group of patients that received placebo, but yet only eight in the vaccine group. So that translates into about 95% uh, effectiveness. Um, and most importantly, that, is, that effectiveness was maintained in patients that were elderly or over the age of, of 65. Um, similarly, in the Moderna study, you can see that there were, again, over 30,000 patients treated, only 95 infections, most of which 90 were in the, in the placebo group, only about five cases in the vaccine group, um, showing or suggesting that it has about a 95% effectiveness two weeks after your second dose. So that's the, the, the magic sequence. We'll talk about dosing in a minute. Um, but there was also the suggestion that in the groups of patients that received the vaccine and did develop an infection, perhaps the seriousness of the progression to severe infection like we saw in that patient I showed you at the opening of our talk may be somewhat reduced. And so there may be not only protection from the virus itself, but if you do get the 
the virus. Um, it may not be as severe as has been seen in patients uh, today. Okay, so we have two vaccines here uh, that are available um, given emergency authorization um, from the Food and Drug Administration and the United States government purchased a supply of both of these agents to be distributed to the American public or population, all right? So let's talk a little bit about the Massachusetts plan. So you can go to the massachusetts.gov website uh, and you can see their plans for vaccination. Um, I, I depict it here in the timeline down the bottom. Uh, the first phase was intended to vaccinate healthcare workers. So uh, for those of us that are at the hospital, we uh, could take care of patients without worrying about being infected. And that has been a problem for many of the nurses. Um, it is certainly uh, even today compromised our staffing. Um, we have gone through periods in our own pharmacy of being challenged with people being out with infection. But the idea was to vaccinate those that are taking care of patients, first responders, like those folks that are working the fire department, the police department, and those patients that are, uh, or individuals that are in congregated settings, um, like correction facilities, shelters, um, et cetera. Phase two was intended to focus um, on our patient population that is sick. Okay, so uh, there is a tiered system that looks at patients that are over the age of 75, those with comorbidities, uh, those folks that are uh, providing or supporting um, essential work, like teachers, uh, public work, sanitation workers, those that work in food and grocery stores, um, et cetera. And then finally, phase three is intended to open to the general public, okay? So the intent of this was to try to create some sort of prioritization to be able to get to healthcare workers, those in confined facilities, um, nursing homes, um, rehabilitation facilities, et cetera, move towards high-risk patients, and then finally um, move to our general population. And you can see the timeline. Um, and we're actually, I think, pretty close to following this timeline right now. I can tell you uh, in the hospital, we're just about finished vaccinating the employees and those that wanted the vaccine, okay? Um, and, and again, if you go to the mass.gov website, um, you can see in real time what their interpretation of the government's interpretation. I know if you watch the news, there isn't a day that goes by without uh, our governor, Charlie Baker, um, talking about uh, the vaccination plan. And I have to say, I think, um, all things considered, given what he's had to work with, I think he's done uh, a remarkable job. Um, and I'm not a politician, nor am I a fan of the politician. Okay, uh, let's talk a minute about getting an appointment. Okay, so the vaccines are present, the plan is present. Um, how are the vaccines being rolled out? Well, you can go to the Massachusetts.gov website, I put the link here, you put in your zip code, you will see a set of vaccination sites that are available near your zip code. You can click on, as I've shown you here on any one of these URL links, and it will take you to the nearest site where you can get vaccinated. And if vaccinations are available, it will show you the times of the vaccines um, or the times of appointments that are available. It's as simple as that, okay? Um, there has been a challenge. Obviously, using this website for many people, my parents are in their late 80s. Um, my mom and dad have incredible difficulties navigating around the internet and understanding the logic and following the sequences. But this has, has been what is set up, showing you the sites of where the vaccination appointments are available. Um, they just recently launched a hotline where you can dial 211 and between the hours of 8.30 and 5 o'clock at night, you can talk to somebody. The intent of this person is not to book your appointment, but to help you walk through the state's website so that you can book them. So this is not a solution of calling your doctor's office and asking for an appointment. Um, the, uh, 
they will lead you back to the website and assist you in getting your appointment scheduled. Now, that leads us to why can't I just call my doctor's office and book an appointment? Well, the answer is, is there's just not enough vaccines currently available to vaccinate all the people in the United States. So recognize the vaccines just started getting into production sometime around December. Um, the factories are working day and night to produce vaccines. The vaccines are being shipped um, every day, but there is not an adequate supply to have everybody show up. So if you call your doctor's office, they're going to tell you either that they don't have the vaccine or if they do, they will allow you to schedule an appointment. I know a very, very few doctor's offices right now that have been granted access. So as a vaccination site, you have to register with the state. You have to use their computer system. The document, and we'll talk a little bit about that on patients you give the vaccine to. Um, to be quite frank, there is a long line I believe of physicians' offices, dental offices, um, and others that are waiting to get approval to be able to do the vaccination. So um, there are a series of sites that have been created, like I suggested, by Massachusetts.gov. Uh, uh, there are big sites, like at Fenway Park, at Gillette Stadium, where the New England Patriots play. The Reggie Lewis Arena in Roxbury should be uh, open last week and should be open this week. And again, um, the intent is, is to go to the Massachusetts website and they should be able to book your appointment. What about your doctor's offices? What about places like Brigham and Women's and Mass General? Well, we are reaching out to individuals following the Massachusetts state guidelines of eligible patients. Um, so through the uh, hospitals patient gateway. Um, we are working through the logistics of identifying patients and then contacting them through email or through electronic means. So if you are on gateway and you are an eligible patient, I have a 92 year old uh, patient who calls me, um, has called me every day for about two months. Uh, he finally got contacted over the weekend uh, through gateway and he set up his appointment. Uh, we also have uh, at MGH Brigham um, a group of about 60 people that are also making calls to individuals, like I mentioned, my elderly parents that don't typically use the computer system. We are making phone calls to individual patients to schedule them for appointments to come into the hospital and get their, uh, their dose. Um, we have um, about 15 sites right now that are open for vaccinations um, and contacting patients. So obviously the main campuses of Massachusetts General and Brigham and Women's Hospital, the individual hospitals within the system, including Newton Wellesley, Faulkner, North Shore Medical Center, um, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and others have been set up. Um, and so we are going through the process based on what we have for vaccines reaching out and contacting people electronically and by phone to schedule their appointments. Okay, Catherine, I'm gonna take a stop here, okay? Um, and take any questions about the logistics of the vaccine for a moment. All right, so the biggest question we've come in, had come in is not so much about the logistics, but it's about eligibility. Okay, we're going to go through that in a second. So we'll go okay. through eligibility in a minute. I want to know if anybody has any questions about calling the state or calling Mass General or showing up. We've had a whole host of patients um, that have shown up at our front door asking to be vaccinated. We will typically turn you away. Um, and ask you to wait until you've been scheduled or we have contacted you for an appointment. Okay. Any idea of when patients in the 75 group, I mean, they're being contacted now, but when it will be a broader? We, uh, so we opened, we opened to patients, that's my dog Otis. Um, we opened to patients 
over the age of 65, and we're contacting those patients now. Um, I think the bigger question is, is for, you know, for people uh, that are between the ages of 40 and 60, for example, that are still going to work every day, you know, when will those patients be contacted? And I'm going to be honest with you. I think that will be closer to March or April um, when we get to routine individuals. Um, it, it's going to take that long. Um, and I do expect that there will be the availability of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. I don't know if we'll have AstraZeneca. But as time goes on, um, I think there's going to be more and more vaccines available to, and more sites to vaccinate people. So recognize we've done this really in an incredibly short period of time. You know, we started setting up vaccinations for our employees in December. It's very efficient. We do about a thousand individuals a day. But um, you know, it's going to take some time before we get really to the general public. So be patient. Okay. Are you going uh, to be talking about allergies? I am. So let's go through those right now. Um, so we screen every single patient that we either uh, come in contact with over the phone um, or we reach out to electronically um, or we have show up for an appointment in our clinic. Um, and basically, there are very few contraindications or problems with individuals um, who can't, who cannot receive either of the Pfizer or Moderna vaccines. So. Um, typically, the patients we don't give it to are those that have had some sort of confirmed anaphylactic reaction um, to a previous dose, to a prior uh, vaccine, or, and I'll talk a little bit about it, the components of the vaccine, okay? So, um, if you have had an allergy problem in the past, my dad, for example, um, is allergic to eggs and has all kinds of allergies and problems. He is an individual that we will typically shepherd you to our allergy group to make sure that they contact and walk you through your signs and symptoms of previous problems to make sure that you're an appropriate candidate. So for the very, very high risk patients that have had problems, we will steer you to our allergy group um, for directions. Um, and advice, okay? I can tell you that's very, very few people, okay? So um, there are some precautions, but again, these are not uh, obstacles to getting the vaccine, um, but more speed bumps. So we really need, to, uh, we don't need to delay in the setting of minor illness. Um, if a patient has fever or symptoms, we can postpone um, if necessary. Um, uh, there's not a concern with people who have had prior COVID infections. Um, uh, the vaccination of individuals who may be infected or in in incubating. Um, uh, again, uh, is unlikely to have a to be an issue for us. Um, and in any of these settings. For patients, um, if there is an issue, we can typically hold off on giving the vaccine or delay it for about four weeks um, if they do have COVID and wait until their symptoms um, have subsided um, or until they're asymptomatic. But I guess my point here is, is even if you have had signs and symptoms of illness, even if you have had COVID, um, we typically can still deliver the vaccine uh, to you and give it to you. John, can you just, I know one of the things, um, if you've had a recent vaccination, another is say like a flu shot or something like that. Um, um, and we'll talk about that. And in those instances, we typically delay, okay? And I'll talk about that in, uh, in a second. Okay, great. Um, but the most important, I, I think, Catherine, is, is you need to go through and get both doses. So one of the things that I have to ensure people, like my 92-year-old friend um, that uh, got scheduled uh, through the phone, is, is you know, the first dose isn't enough. The 
clinical trials that were set up uh, mandate that a second dose is given. So when you come into the clinic, you're gonna get your first dose. Before you leave, make sure your second dose is scheduled. We had a whole host of problems in one of the vaccination centers where patients left and didn't get their second appointment scheduled. So you'll come in, you'll get your first dose. There is a 15 minute observation period. Okay, we will record your vaccination. Um, and for those of you that are concerned about conspiracies, that information is gonna be shared with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So the patients we vaccinate, if you are vaccinating in any location, the documentation is being provided to the Massachusetts Immunization Information System. So the state uh, provides us with the vaccines. I'll talk a little bit about that. We administer the vaccines, but we also feed back information to tell them who has been vaccinated. So they know exactly um, you know, who we've treated so, so far, okay? And the information in, is done in real time, okay? Um, and then finally, uh, the mandates right now is even though I've received two doses of vaccine um, and I'm hoping that I'm protected, um, I still am mandated in the hospital and outside of the hospital and my infectious disease colleagues recommend this, that you still need to follow good infection control practices. That means physical distancing, masking, washing your hands. So the vaccine, if you get it, it's still not considered a cure or it does not absolve you from walking away um, from all of the good uh, infection control practices that have been established in the last year. Um, there are side effects. Uh, this is what has been documented in the clinical trials of the patients. Uh, those almost um, a little over or a little under 100,000 patients. You can see that it doesn't go, uh, you know, it, it's not perfect. So there are some people that will have redness at the site of infection. There are some people that will develop fatigue or chills or muscle pain, joint pain or headaches. Um, in our hospital setting, most of our employees have reported these issues after the second dose, not so much with the first dose, but after the second dose. And they are typically self-limiting it varies from individual to individual, but usually within a few hours, these side effects disappear and you should be fine. So um, we classify the events as local reactions, systemic reactions, um, and we have had some severe allergic reactions that we would not have been able to predict. Um, and I think that's been unfortunate, but they have been extremely rare. Um, and I can tell you, if we're doing a thousand employees or patients a day at the hospital, um, we typically do not see an allergic reaction every day. I would tell you it's probably less than once a week, maybe once every two to three weeks. Um, people becoming dizzy is not uncommon um, after the vaccine and that typically absolves within about 15 minutes. And it's one of the reasons why after the vaccination, we ask that you hang around with us for about 15 to 30 minutes, okay? Um, I mentioned this earlier, the, uh, the allergists um, understand these types of reactions extremely well, whether they're immediate or delayed. Um, but I'll also tell you that sometimes it's not the components or the vaccine uh, protein itself but it's actually the diluents or the solvents that we put into the vaccines um, when they are made. And one of the, or a couple of the culprits that are commonly identified are polyethylene glycol and polysorbate. These are uh, solubilizing or emulsifying agents that are added to the vaccines so that they go into solution. Um, and you'll see them typically listed um, as one of if you've had problems with these agents in the past, there is a possibility that you would have a problem with the vaccines. Um, we're prepared for anything and everything that happens in the hospital. And we're prepared for anything and everything at places 
like Gillette Stadium, the Reggie Lewis Arena, um, at, uh, the Double Tree Hotel. All of the sites have the medications and expertise in emergency response. So if someone does um, become dizzy, if someone does start to develop an allergic reaction, the medications are all available and the expertise is available uh, to treat these patients. Now let's get into some of the questions about who we can and cannot vaccinate. Um, so there were questions early on about pregnancy. Can we vaccinate uh, women, young women that are pregnant? And the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology recommends that the vaccine should not be withheld for patients who meet the eligibility criteria for a vaccination. So if you are a young woman and pregnant, I would advise you to talk to your obstetrician and see what their recommendations are. But we have typically vaccinated these employees. We don't have a lot of data in terms of what was, you know, will happen uh, because the patient population was not included in the trials. But um, the recommendations right now is, is that it appears to be okay to do. Similarly, same thing with breastfeeding. If you are a nursing mom or lactating, it appears to be fine for you to be able to uh, receive the vaccine, okay? And it shouldn't be withheld. And those are also recommendations from the American College of Oncology. And if you are a young woman or even a young man um, and you are contemplating um, uh, the planning of pregnancies, um, the recommendations are, again, not to withhold the administration of the vaccines. Um, I know Catherine talked or asked me to talk about patients with blood clots. Um, that does not appear to be a problem, but we have not looked at that patient population. So if you are a patient with antiphospholipid um, uh, antiphospholipid syndrome, or if you're a patient with uh, lupus anticoagulant, Again, uh, we don't know uh, whether or not uh, there is, um, we haven't studied this population, but the recommendations now is better to have the protection of the vaccine rather than uh, be exposed to the, the virus without some sort of protection. And the same holds true for those that have had um, conditions like hemophilia, HIV, um, organ transplant, um, uh, and other conditions, uh, cancer that may suggest uh, that uh, you may be at risk um, in terms of getting the vaccine, the recommendations uh, to move ahead, all right? Now, Catherine asked about co-administration with other vaccines, okay? And as I suggested for many of those other instances of patient groups, we don't have a lot of data um, there is suggestion that there could be interference or even possible inactivation of the vaccines um, if we deliver a number of different vaccines at the same point in time. And so the recommendations are to have individuals wait at least seven days before they receive any other vaccines. So um, if you are thinking you're going to get come to the clinic and get COVID, uh, get influenza, get varicella, get shingles. The answer is, is that's not going to be a good strategy, okay? You're best off getting the COVID vaccine separately and then scheduling your remaining vaccines at another date with your primary care practitioner, okay? Um, and then finally, um, a series of questions that I've answered, uh, you know, consistently over the the last several weeks. Now, how long do the vaccines work? We don't know, okay? We know that it, uh, antibodies from the vaccines persist for at least four months. Um, and recognize we only started vaccinating people in the summer. A number of us in the hospital are enrolled. I'm enrolled in a trial. I have my antibodies tested uh, about every month now. Um, and we'll continue to do so in the future to see how long there is this element 
um, of the vaccine being um, active, generating antibodies. So um, there's more to come on whether or not we need a booster. Those plans are being developed right now. What about these emerging strains? I just listened to ABC uh, News and apparently the United Kingdom strain is moving its way across the United States and has become the most virulent form. Um, again, we don't know uh, about how well the vaccines will work against these emerging strains because they weren't here when we started our clinical trials in the summer um, and they weren't here in December when we first uh, started vaccinating. There is some suggestion that there is efficacy with the individual viruses. I put here the Moderna virus producing neutralizing antibodies uh, for one of the variants, but I think there's more to come. I think the most important message is, is if you're waiting for the perfect COVID-19 vaccine, um, you'll be waiting for a long time and there's a possibility during your waiting period, you become, effect, uh, become infected. So the recommendations are don't wait, don't wait for a new vaccine, don't wait for emerging strains, get uh, access to the vaccine and have it now. Um, and the rest of the stories are, are really, uh, you know, uh, if I, if I want to refer to it, it's plumbing, okay? Um, there's been a lot of concerns with the distribution of the virus vaccines because of the storage requirements. Um, this platform has to be kept frozen. The vaccines have to be kept frozen or ultra cold which uh, generates challenges for us. Um, and I think if you look in many of the publications, this one came from the Wall Street Journal, that the media has greatly simplified the production of the virus, its transport, and its administration. Um, and I'll give kudos to my colleague, Rick Du, who I've worked with for many years and sent me a whole host of information surrounding the different uh, vaccines. And I'll, I'll provide this little graphic for you. It's a lot more than um, just having the manufacturer generate the vaccines. Uh, there are a number of distribution systems that have created, have been created for both uh, companies using Federal Express and UPS to get the vaccines to the state of Massachusetts, who then distributes, distributes those vaccines to the individual sites for patient administration. That's not really where the problems have come in. It's surrounding the information systems to be able to identify who's been vaccinated and how many patients. Getting that information back through to the center of disease control from all the different states through health and human services and their computer system back to the manufacturer. And I can tell you, the reasons that we had great difficulty in identifying how many patients are coming, how many patients we need vaccines for, is really rooted in many of the archaic computer systems that are still in place. Many, um, I can tell you, we don't, did not have a system set up for COVID-19 vaccines. We had to set it up our own electronic health record. Like I said, we're transmitting that information back to the state, but we also don't have a system of communicating what doses have been used and getting that information back to the Center for Disease Control, back to human services, health and human services, and then back to the manufacturer. Most of that work is being done manually um, in simple computer spreadsheets like Microsoft Excel. So um, you want to Pick um, a major problem, a bottleneck that has occurred. It really has surrounded um, the ability to share information surrounding the supplies, um, the scheduling of patients, the scheduling of manufacturing, and what has been used, and being able to optimize uh, the delivery. Um, and in fact, um, that's me here. Um, none of this has worked pristinely well, and in many instances, you know, we are juggling supplies of vaccine across our system, 
and across our hospitals so that um, each hospital has enough to make it through the day. And our work typically starts around two o'clock in the morning. Um, and as uh, like tonight, um, we are still transmitting information for tomorrow's appointment so that we have enough doses available for the patients we treat. But with all that said, um, the numbers of patients continues to rise. Uh, on the left is the uh, vaccination rates in the United States, we're well over a million patients. You can see on the graphic to the right that some states have done extremely well. The darkest colors show the states that are doing extremely well in organizing their vaccine deliveries and administrations. And so, um, every time, I think we're uh, going to get better at this as we go forward. Okay. So let's stop there, okay? Um, Catherine, I, I got through all of the stuff. What is out there for questions now that I've thrown on for about 50 minutes? All right. Well, thank you, first of all, John, for a really thorough and comprehensive overview of what is a really quickly changing situation. So that was really helpful. Um, and thank you again for taking the time this evening, considering you've been at the hospital since 6 a.m. So it's a yeah, long day. For you. Every day. Yeah. Um, so a couple questions specific to this audience. Um, first of all, you had mentioned about bleeding. Patients yep. who are on an anticoagulant. That is one of the questions they ask when you're, you know, doing the pre-screening form. Are you on an anticoagulant? Is there a concern for patients who are on an anticoagulant? Um, there is not right now. Um, but like in many instances, uh, when we put patients on uh, anticoagulants or antiplatelet therapy, there is an elevated risk of, of bleeding. Um, Right now, we don't believe uh, there is any reasons for concern with being on an anticoagulant, either a direct oral agent like Xarelto or Eliquis, or an older agent like Humanin or Warfarin. Um, but we do maintain that question as part of the screening process. So um, my answer is, is not a concern. But we are screening patients for conditions, you know, like hemophilia, a tendency towards bleeding, a tendency towards allergic reactions. Okay. All right. Um, in regards to patients that have a history of blood clots, DVTs or PEs, um, I think you had said that the vaccines do elicit some sort of like inflammatory response. Is there any concern that the vaccine could provoke another blood clot in these patients? Uh, I don't know, and I don't think we know the answer to that yet. Um, you know, I think um, in this instance, was it Donald Trump that said the cure can't be worse than the disease? Um, I think uh, in this instance, uh, for people, who are at risk for blood clots. Um, certainly, we've seen patients who are infected with uh, COVID-19. Uh, that certainly generates a systemic uh, inflammatory response. And there is certainly a heightened coagulable state in many patients. We certainly see, like the case I presented, many patients developing thrombosis. So I think in this setting, getting the vaccine is a better preventative step um, in preventing the virus than not getting the vaccine and possibly getting COVID and being susceptible to blood clots. So I think the balance is in the side of getting the vaccine, um, okay, rather than um, not. Okay. Um, you touched on this a little bit, but just to clarify, people who have a um, genetic clotting disorder, such as factor five, protein S, is there any reason to believe that, um, you know, the mRNA vaccines could be harmful for these patients? Um, my, my answer is no, not, uh, there is no signals yet, and in fact, you know, I have to tell you the this new 
technology, if you will, seems to be remarkably safe. Um, so uh, I think, you know, once we've got millions of people vaccinated across the United States, the one thing you should appreciate is, is you know, in the 30,000 or 40,000 patients that were enrolled in the trials, there were only, you know, a little over 100, if you will, infections. So um, I don't think we'll have a real picture of uh, safety and vigilance until we have managed to move across and vaccinate lots and lots of individuals. I suspect there won't be a problem, um, but I think if there is a signal, we'll see it pretty quick, okay? Um, and it, like I said, we're already at the point, Catherine, of vaccinating over a million people in the United States. There is an adverse event reporting system. So if we do have a problem, we are mandated to report that to the government um, in their um, adverse event reporting system. And I suspect if there's a problem, we'll see it pretty quick. Um, but it hasn't occurred yet. Okay. Um, is a history of blood clots, does that put you in a high risk category that might qualify you for a vaccination in one of the lower tiers? Um, we, you know, I, I don't believe, um, you know, just being on anticoagulant therapy is going to give you a ticket to walk into the Brigham and Women's Hospital and get vaccinated. Um, I do think that you'll be in that second phase of individuals. So if you've had, you know, prior pulmonary embolism, a DVT, you've got this uh, comorbidity that exists. Um, and I think you'll be in the group that gets vaccinated earlier than say somebody like me that's 60 years old and doesn't have any, have any comorbidities other than hypertension and hypercholesterolemia. Okay, so I, I, I think, um, I think, you know, eventually that group of people will get vaccinated earlier than the general public. Okay. All right, well, we're at about eight o'clock, a um, little past. So any final words of advice for, for people or, or words of wisdom? Yeah, I, I, I mean, Catherine, I, I, you know, we've been doing COVID vaccines 24 seven for almost, um, well, we finished two months now and we're a week in February. Um, I, I think for our audience tonight, um, be vigilant. Um, I suspect if you're in a community um, and you are in a high risk population or an elevated risk uh, population, you know, your community will probably be the ones that reach out to you first, because I know a lot of towns have set up now and have uh, vaccination uh, centers uh, available. And I think they're working quite well. So be vigilant if you're in your community, you know, for alerts surrounding those clinics. So I know for my parents uh, in the community they live in, the local newspaper advertised, um, they made a phone call and they were scheduled. It was simple as that um, within a few days. Um, so I think you're gonna find the ability to get the vaccine in the clinic, uh, in your community. I think you're gonna find the ability to get the vaccine as we stand up um, the hope in a place like Gillette Stadium is to do, you know, five to 10,000 vaccines a day, okay? Um, I know Fenway Park has been set up. I don't know if Fenway Park will be remain set up when the Red Sox stop playing, but I think there'll be other hubs that the state has identified as being large vaccination centers, and I think that'll be an option. I think once there's enough vaccine supply, you know, if you're a patient of our system, we'll have vaccine available for you. And then finally, I think many of the doctor's offices, when the supply becomes steady enough, that they will have access uh, to the vaccines as well. 
um, recognize, you know, that the, the part of this has been treacherous has been, you know, moving frozen vaccine supplies in and around, you know, different states. Um, as more vaccines become available, that freezer requirement is going to go away. And then I think um, it becomes much easier to have product available at individual practice sites. And I, so I think you'll be able to get your vaccines as part of your local encounters with your, you know, your uh, primary care or community physician. So be patient with us. Um, be patient with the politicians. Um, uh, I think we're going to get this done. It's going to take a little bit of time. And then all of a sudden, I think there's going to be a lot of vaccines available in a lot of different locations. All right. Well, I hope you're right. I know you are. So I know how hard you yep. guys are all working at this to get it out there and um, looking forward to when we can see you in person again. Ah, I look forward to that. Well, I actually look forward to not having to carry boxes to different sites uh, <laughs> to and from. You know, uh, I, I have to tell you that picture with a box um is filled with dry ice and must have weighed 200 pounds and i'm, oh I'm yeah i'm i'm not a, a very weak weak pharmacist you know <laughs> i've learned i should have been lifting weights instead of lifting, uh you know medical journals to read anyway um yeah Catherine, they had my people have my contacts on the natf website yeah, um, my phone number, uh, you can find me by just dialing the main number of the hospital. I have taken hundreds of uh, phone calls from individuals over the last several weeks. Um, some we've been able to help immediately. Some we have said, you know, you need to wait a little bit longer. Um, but if you have a concern or a problem or a question, I'm happy to answer it. Absolutely. And you can always reach out to the NATF staff too, and we can put you in touch with the right people. So, all right, everyone. Well, thank you for joining us this evening. We hope, you know, at least the majority of your questions were answered. And thank you again, John, for being so thorough and for taking this extra time. You'd probably rather be sleeping. Um, yeah. you with my, us I gotta go feed my dog. Yeah, I'm already behind schedule. Well, listen, have a good evening, Catherine. Thank Thanks. you so much. All, all right. right, bye everyone, good night.